Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome to the Master Mix podcast. I'm Mike and Davina, and thank you so much for joining me today. There, as I'm recording this, there's a construction crew that just decided to set up a jackhammer outside of my window. So hopefully it's not too distracting throughout the interview. Hopefully you guys don't even hear it, but it's just been driving me nuts. Anyway, today is a really fun interview. I'm interviewing Zach Servini, who he's an amazing engineer that's worked with a ton of massive bands, and he's just really built a name for himself. He's worked with bands like Good Charlotte, Blink-182, Fever 333, Goldfinger, Five Seconds of Summer, like The U's. He, he's worked with so many bands and he's really just built a name for himself in a very short period of time and he's worked with some amazing producers as well and he's gone on to mix a lot of records too so it's a pleasure to have him on here today because he gives some really cool insight into some massive records that he's worked on and his approach just to you know adapting and where he lives in LA like it sounds like everybody's working real fast and having to work real fast so it's cool to hear how he adapts very easily and it's also interesting, too, because we, we talked near the beginning about adapting during the quarantine as well and how this has caused a shift for him with monitors and, you know, he's learned to mix on headphones. So that's something that's not something we discuss too often on the podcast, but it's really cool to hear someone who's making massive records on headphones. So I'm really excited for you guys to dig into this interview and listen to all of the great advice that Zach has here today. So let's just jump right into it. Zach Servini, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. <laughs> awesome, man. I appreciate that. For people who might not be familiar with you or your background, uh, can you give us a little bit of your story on how you got started, what you do, and ultimately how you got to where you are now? Yeah. So the quick story is that um, so I'm 27 years old right now. I've been producing bands since I was about 14 when I was in high school, you know, got a Mac laptop, started recording a bunch of local bands. I was never in a band, actually. I just kind of like skipped to producing bands, which it was just like what I loved. Um, and then I wound up working for a producer named Machine and a producer named Will Putney. And then a couple years later, I wound up coming out to LA. I worked for a producer named John Feldman for a long time. And now I've been on my own for the past couple of years and just been producing, mixing, songwriting myself. I'm managed by a company called MDDN, which is founded by Benji and Joel Madden, who sing for the band Good Charlotte. So them and a guy named Joey Simmerin are my managers and they take care of me and everything. And they have a beautiful studio. And so I have a studio at their facilities and I just, I work out of there and I work out of my bedroom and that's kind of what I do. I love that. I love that uh, with all of that stuff and the people you work with, like you're still doing a lot of work out of your bedroom. <laughs> Man. Uh, yeah. So, so honestly, the pandemic hit a few months ago and I was, I, I've been doing a lot more. Mixing has always been my favorite part of the production process. You know, I write, I produce, I engineer like that comes along with it but mixing has just always fascinated me for some reason i've just been obsessed with it forever and so i i it's i've been doing a lot of it and so when the pandemic hit the studio actually closed down and we weren't really supposed to be there and so i was like i need to figure out a different way to do things so at the studio i had i have like my setup is pretty minimal it's just a I, I've, I'm a person who's very invested in technology. So I'm all about like UAD stuff and that I, I just like to keep things simple with the minimal amount of variables because it makes things, it makes the creative process easier. Like that's, that's a, that's another discussion, but I was like, I need to figure out a way to mix that's not on the studio on my barefoot monitors. So I bought a maxed out Mac laptop. I just like took the plunge and I set it up in my bedroom. And I kind of, over the last couple of months, I've developed a system where I mix on my laptop through or with my with my UAD what is it my UAD Apollo Twin X and I mix on these Sennheiser HD 600 headphones and literally Apple earbuds. Those are my two main frames of reference for mixing. And then I'll check it in the car. I'll drive to the studio. I'll check it on the barefoots. Like I'll check it. I'll check it on my AirPods, a bunch of places, but I've been mixing 
95 to 100% on headphones and 60 to 70% on Apple AirPods and, and Apple earbuds lately. Wow. So, yeah. So my, my process has changed a lot the last couple of months. And honestly, I've never been happier with my mixes and people have never been happier with my mixes. So it's kind of crazy. That's so awesome to hear. Cause you know, you mentioned you have barefoots and some people think, oh, well, barefoots, like, you know, those are crazy expensive and whatever. And then you're kind of at the same time being like, yeah, these cheap headphones do the, do a great job too. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So what was it's, that transition like? Like, how did you go from you know, big, full out, awesome speakers to like these AirPods. Like, I know a lot of people tend to blame their monitors for why their mixes suck. And that's probably not the real reason why their mixes suck. But, you know, <laughs> you know it's it's funny to hear people say like, yeah, we just mix on cheap monitors and get an awesome results. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what was it, that transition like? It was it was super scary because at the beginning, mixing on monitors is all I've ever done my entire life. You know what I mean? And so I was like, if this pandemic is going to be a thing, I just need to figure out a way to do it on something else. So I, I just wound up like it, it was a lot of reference mixing, like a lot of referencing things I've done and using plug in chains that I know work and referencing other people's work, um, on, on many different systems to kind of figure it out. So it's like, so, so eat everything, the, the different pairs of headphones that I use all have kind of a different purpose. And this has just taken a couple months for me to figure out, but it's like, like I'll dial in, you know, the low end and the initial mix on my Sennheisers. And then once the, uh, once the mix is kind of roughed out, I'll go on my Apple, um, earbuds for like an hour or so. And, and it, and just kind of flipping back and forth and making thing making sure things don't sound harsh and making sure things hit hard and, and all that kind of stuff and i've just found if it doesn't sound harsh on the apple earbuds and the balance is good then it generally will kind of translate and so then i'll flip it to my airpods and make sure that that and make sure that all the balances and everything like nothing's like jumping out and there's usually a couple things that will jump out at me and so then um i'll take it into the car check the low end see how that's doing and then I'll, I might take it to the studio and listen to it on the barefoots and those, the barefoots are extremely high detail speakers. So I'll usually hear like some room noise or some guitar noise that I wasn't hearing in my headphones, like some kind of details like that, but just, just referencing it on a bunch of different things. Um, it's, I, I personally enjoy doing that and, um, it, it honestly, it makes the process like so much easier for me. That's awesome. I, I love how you approach that with like referencing the low end on your Sennheisers and then checking everything else on the AirPods. Cause it, it's kind of like being in a studio and having multiple sets of monitors there too, right? Like exactly. people will listen on the big far field speakers and listen to the low end there. And then they'll listen to like the NS tens and focus on their mid range there. Right. So you're taking the very, a very similar approach, but just doing it to headphones. So yep, that's very exactly. Cool. Exactly. I always remember too, like Chris Lord Algae, huge fan of his, like huge fan of his growing up, like one of my heroes for sure. And I just always remember reading interviews with him and he would say that he would kind of dial the mix in on his NS10s or his mains or whatever he was using. And then he would flip to like a boom box in the back of the room because that's how a lot of consumers were listening to music like this, like these interviews are probably from 10, 15 years ago. And so he would do the majority of the mix on the boom box and make sure that it sounded good there. And so just kind of fast forward a few years, the Apple earbuds are kind of like my boom box because everyone listens to music on AirPods and they sound amazing. So I'm like, why not just make sure it sounds great on those from the get-go and then kind of tailor it to other systems. That's awesome. So going back, you had mentioned that when you got your start, you were kind of just, you just jumped right into production. And so how did you learn production? Like, were you just self-taught at the beginning and then you somehow managed to get in with machine and those guys or like, how did that all start for you? So I, this, I started a little over 10 years ago and it was, it was before there were, you know, a lot of places like yours to go to, to get advice and learn things about mixing and production and stuff. There were, there were a couple of forums online, but but it was pretty much you kind of just had to figure it out for yourself. And so I'm just, I am just obsessed with what I do, like to a fault to my girlfriend's fault a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I could, ne I could never stop thinking about it. And so it's just like when I would, when I would record a band at in my parents' basement when I was growing up, I would just, 
I would just get a couple microphones and I would just listen to albums that I loved and I would just be like, why doesn't my stuff sound like that? And I would just listen to it for hours and hours and do whatever I could. I didn't know, I didn't know what a compressor did. I didn't know what an EQ did. I didn't know what anything did. I would just kind of mess around in GarageBand and Pro Tools until something sounded better to me or sounded like kind of close to the way I wanted it to sound, I guess. It, I w it was just all trial and error and just all using my ears and, and also, um, be, like I'm a guitar player as well. So just having kind of a musical ear and just being able to listen to people's performances and make sure the performance and tuning and timing and all that stuff is on point. Um, that's really important as well. But yeah, it was just a bunch of trial and error and obsessing over things and staying up all night. And, you know, a lot of that for years and years. And I'm, and I'm still constantly every day learning and evolving. And I'm, st I, I still am not even close to where I want to be today. So it's, it's still, it's weird because even over 10 years down the line, I can look back and be like, oh, wow, I've done this. Like, like if you told me when I was 15 that I would be doing what I'm doing today, I would have been like, you're crazy. You know what I mean? But um, at the same time, it doesn't feel any different to me now. Like when I go to approach a mix or approach a production or whatever, it still feels exactly the same as it did when I did it when I was in my parents' basement. I, st I still feel exactly the same. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but yeah. Yeah, you're just still chasing like the best quality sound you can get, right? And making it sound yeah. like it's a modern standard. I love that. I love that you you mentioned that you're constantly learning. And I, I think that that's a really important part for, for a lot of people is that like, you can't just think that you've done it all and there's no more learning and you're just going through the motions, right? You got to constantly push yourself. And it sounds like, you know, you've worked with a lot of different producers and a lot of different artists and different styles. So that in itself is going to force you to learn different techniques and different approaches to things, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I work with a lot of different genres, a lot of different kinds of artists, and also the times are constantly always changing. So like, for instance, now everyone's real concerned about how is my music going to be loud on Spotify? How's it going to sound in a Spotify playlist? And Spotify has like their own algorithms for how they turn things down. And so mastering engineers have to compensate for that. And, and stuff doesn't have to be as loud anymore. So, so times are changing in that respect. Um, but yes, I do also work for, I work with a large array of artists. Um, I grew up listening to strictly like death metal, death core, like super heavy music. And also I loved Katy Perry, Dr. Luke, Max Martin style pop music when I was growing up. For some reason, I just loved like those two extremes. Um, so yeah, it's funny. Like, like I, I've made a ton of metal records and a ton of heavy rock records. And on the flip side, I've also made a ton of pop records. Um, so yeah, it, but I still, it's the process for everything is pretty much the same. And I just go through kind of similar, a, a similar creative process just to, it just needs to sound like good and competitive and like awesome at the end of the day. Like that's pretty much is the end goal. For sure. And I, I love that you are such a, a versatile producer and that you, yeah, you do work on like punk metal pop like you've done a little bit of like hip-hop inspired stuff as well like a lot of engineers struggle to make an identity for themselves in just one genre so why do you think it is that you've been able to have so much success in so many different genres well growing up well first of all i wouldn't really consider myself like super successful yet um but but growing up uh rick rubin was always a huge i was always really big into him and i always really dug how he could seamlessly jump from producing slayer to producing ll cool j to producing the red hot chili peppers and that he didn't really have like a sound like you couldn't pinpoint oh this record was made by Rick Rubin. All the records were just amazing, but you wouldn't, he didn't have a signature like kick drum or guitar sound or something. And I always thought that that was really cool because it helped the artist shine through um, as best as they could. Like the albums he produces, the art, it, it, it always, it sounds like the best version of the band. Um, so to a smaller degree, um, that is very much what I strive for. Like I strive to not have, um, I'm sure there is like some kind of sonic footprint to some of my stuff, but, um, but I, I strive to, when people hear my 
recordings or my mixes i just want them to be like wow that sounds really amazing that sounds really good like it and and i want them to think about the band i don't want them to be thinking about me when they're listening to it so i like i want to uh, like it's not about me it's about the art and it's about the band so i just want the band to sound the best that they can possibly sound and i don't want them to sound like another band that i'm working with i want everyone to have their own identity you know so that's kind of where that comes from that makes a lot of sense i know like la is kind of known for being a place where sessions go fast it's like you gotta you you boot through things really quickly and you know you push out songs really fast so with that being said like you know i don't i don't know how reliant you are on using templates and and using stuff to get you up and running fast but I'm, i'm curious about that and if you are using templates how do you go about adapting these templates to such a wide range of artists because you know like you said you're trying to make it sound like the artist and not kind of like your template right so you know how do you go about with how do you go about that approach so yes i do have a template that i will start with that has so every project i do i learn and this has been going on for years you know i'll learn like wow that's a really dope synth based sound or wow that's a really good vocal effect or something and and every project i learn i just will always take away these certain kind of sounds or presets or whatever that I'll just, I'll just be, I just have them on hand. It's like, if someone comes in and they're like, Oh, I want this clean guitar sound. I'll be like, Oh, that's like something I did like a few years ago. Like, let me like pull that out. So pretty much every project I do, I have a big template and I'm just constantly evolving it and adding to it and changing to it. And so when I load it up, there's just kind of a bunch of starting points for a lot of things that already sound like great. Like I have, um, I have live drums in there that sound awesome. I have a bass sound in there. That's great. I have a bunch of guitar sounds, you know, a bunch of vocal sounds, um, mix bus sounds and, and just anything to get it sounding like a finished mix really quickly, but they're all starting points. So it's not like I ever load up the template and just record things in there and then just bounce it like it's it, that's that's not the point the point is just to get things sounding really good really quickly and then we can change them and experiment and find happy accidents um along the way kind of but the template is basically just so that we're not starting from ground zero it's just like it's just to get people inspired it's just to get things happening quickly and and get things moving really fast and it it works really well for me as well same thing with a mix like i'll use the same template if i'm like mixing a song if i don't know where to start i'll just be like all right let me start with these drum sounds and hopefully they work and if they don't work i'll tweak them and then if they really don't work i'll find something else but it's just it the point of the template is just to have really good starting points for a lot of different things that's awesome. So when you talk about like drum sounds being part of your template, are you talking about like program drums? Or are you just talking about like your normal signal signal chains and you usually have a kit kind of set up and ready to go? It depends on both. We do do a lot of program drums lately. So I do have uh, like a couple different program drum settings that I really like that I've that I've evolved over the years. And then I do I can I can apply really similar settings to live drums um, to get them to sound really similar. I'm 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 super picky with drum sounds as well. So I've kind of just developed all these things over the years. And when I find something, I kind of tend to use it just because I I've tried. Man, I've been down the rabbit hole so many different times, and I've just found stuff that has worked for me. So that's kind of something that a lot of the times I don't want to change like too much because it can just, it can change everything for the worse. But it's like, if I have like a kick and snare sound that I love, a lot of the times we'll augment that with like, for instance, if I'm, for an example, if I'm working with like an industrial group, we'll have like a banging live drum sound that I already have ready to go, but then maybe someone will bring in their their analog sampler and so then we'll layer that on top of it to give it a different character but it still has the punch and drive of the drum sounds that i love that i know work so so a lot of a lot of augmenting and giving sounds different characters and things like that happens for sure yeah and i was curious about that because when i listen to your productions there's a lot of stuff that has a live drum sound and then there's a lot of like programmed sample electronic kind of sounds how and when in the production process do you decide when you're going to go the live route versus the sampled route and, you know, or blend them? Like, when do you make that decision? It kind of just happens throughout the day. I'm the kind of producer that if we're writing a song and we're making a song, we kind of just get it all done 
in one day. Um, we just get it all out really quickly. And that, it, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because that's something that I always struggle with. And that's something that we always struggle with. Sometimes an artist may come in thinking that they want a program drum sound or a fake drum sound. And then throughout the day, we end up realizing that they actually do want a live drum sound or like we just start blending. We're just like, mm, the program drums aren't hitting right. And then we'll start to layer the live drums and then we'll be like, you know, it sounds better with strictly the live drums only. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that I'm constantly fighting with and that a lot of um, artists I do are always, it's, we're always just experimenting. Um, and it, and so it also, it also depends on the band as well. Like if I'm producing a band like all time low, I tend to think about the live show a lot. And when you see them live, they're a rock band with a drummer. So yeah, we're going to want to have live drums. Um, but if I'm producing, I have this artist called Poppy that I work with, who's super amazing. Um, it's like weird metal fused with the Beach Boys. It's like a really bizarre project, but it's really cool. Um, and kind of anything goes and she's a solo artist. So we can she will have a drummer live a lot of the times but we can use program drums and they will make sense because there's not a drummer in her band that makes sense for sure yeah i'm always curious about that because like you listen to a lot of poppy or pop rock productions and you know you'll find that some tracks will have that electronic sound and some have that live sound so you know how do you find that balance and make them all sound consistent with each other right so yeah i was i was it's interesting to hear you say that that's one of the things you struggle with because yeah you could definitely it's like all production right now. It's all digital. You can throw everything at it because you've got infinite tracks and whatever. Right. So it's sometimes taking that objective, you know, 10,000 foot view and being like, okay, this does sound better this way or that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, call me like old school or whatever, but like, I, I'm just, I'm a big fan of shows and I miss them so much. And I'm a big fan of just great bands that can sound amazing live with drums, bass, guitars, vocal, like, like I'm, I'm a big fan of that that's just personally what i like a lot like for instance there's this band called the interrupters who i'm working with right now super amazing punk band from la and they i love those guys yeah oh yeah they're awesome and they and so they hit me up uh maybe a year ago and they were like hey we we're doing this youtube live session thing and we'd love for you to just throw a quick mix on it and i was like cool so they actually covered the song bad guy by billy eilish and it, it was just them live in the room day off on tour they covered it i mixed it in like two three hours and but they're such a great band and they just they don't you know they don't play to a click it was literally just them playing in the room and i it was super easy to mix because they're so great and now that song is it it's gotten a ton of syncs and it's like shooting up the radio charts and it's literally just that they didn't even record it for real it's just them playing live in a studio mic'd up like one take and i'm like that's that's really cool to me and that's stuff that i love so yeah that's awesome how involved do you get when you're producing a record like where what do you see your role as a producer being and i know that you are a songwriter do you get involved in the songwriting process or is that something that sometimes you do sometimes you don't you know what are it depends on the situation from band to band usually i will wind up creating a large amount of material with the band from scratch however i do like it when bands come to me with songs that they have or at least kind of ideas that they have and something to jump off of so that we're not just in the room just starting from nothing um but yeah with most projects there's there's a lot of people that want to come that want to come in and have have me start with a beat or a guitar or something and kind of build around that um and then there's a lot of people as well who want to who bring in their own songs and have me produce them as well but i would say i'm i'm quite heavy handed in terms of production and, um, you know, producing demos and like changing the sound of the demo and stuff. And that's, that's, but that's kind of what people come to me for. Like I, it would be really easy just to have a band come to me with, you know, fully thought out produced songs and just have me like record them. But that just doesn't really happen like that hasn't really happened to me too much so like bands bands enjoy collaborating with me on on creating the actual music itself and i i like doing that too so yeah it's it's pretty heavy-handed in that for sure that's awesome because i i feel like that is something that 
has kind of become a little bit of a lost art when it comes to recording. Like, you know, you think back to like the seventies and stuff like that. And, you know, people would book studio time for a month or whatever, and they would just write songs in the studio and how did everything mic'd up and everything. But you find, I, I find that less and less these days because there is so much digital stuff. People can do it from home. And I, I, I mean, my experience is that people come usually with songs ready to go, but it, it is really cool that you've kind of cemented yourself as this collaborative songwriter. And that is something that kind of separates you from a lot of people. So you attract bands that are into that kind of thing. I would say that that is fairly common in LA as well. It's like, if you go to someone to do a co-write, it will wind up turning into the production a lot of the times. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that as well, because I'm I'm also a big fan of people get demoitis and demoitis is a real thing, but there is magic in the demo. There is always magic in the demo. And so that way, when we're creating the song and ge- recording the performances for the first time and everyone's all excited about it, I have... I, I've over the years, I've just tried to develop a way to be able to capture the demos, but make them sound like a finished record. That's that's kind of my goal when I'm producing. A band. Sure. Well, and that makes sense. You're you're an engineer as opposed to just like the regular songwriter who might not have those engineering skills. So that gives you that advantage as well. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So you said that a lot of people will come to you kind of looking for some songs that maybe you've written to kind of spring off of. So how how do you divide up your time so that you can like dedicate days to writing only versus, you know, co-writing versus just engineering? Like how, how how does that work for you? Where do you find that time? That is a really tricky thing on any given day. I could work on five things like for instance like this like this morning before we did this podcast, I was working on finishing up mixing like this christmas ep or something i'm working on and then yeah we're doing this podcast now and then um yeah i'm mixing some stuff for the interrupters after this and then um i'm going to the studio with um joel from good charlotte like we're doing like a session with like a new artist that he has and then i'll probably come back and mix another project i'm working on from england um so it's like i try to just i try to just honestly i try to keep it moving and i am I am super organized. Like I do really try to plan out the day, a day, a day ahead of time. Like I try to plan out, okay, I need to get these things done the next day and then just make sure that I hit them all. But people are constantly hitting me with fire drills and last minute stuff. So I just kind of have to always be prepared for whatever might be thrown at me. So to answer your question, I, I just work a lot and I just grind it out, but I, love doing it um so i and i try to be as organized as i can but sometimes it's just kind of is impossible so i just try to be ready for anything to happen at all times i would say yeah well i guess that's just what it's like out there right it's like well in a lot of studios you just have to be very easily adaptable quick to quick to make movements and you know just adapt to anything so that's very cool to hear how much variety goes into your day you know (laughs) yeah yeah there's yeah there's a lot going on for sure yeah that's another reason too that mixing is like my favorite part of the process right now because when i am mixing i found a way to do it kind of at home so it's i can hang out with my girlfriend and like make food and like go on a walk and still like accomplish something like really like big during the day and it's like it's 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 really fun so yeah that's why i like doing that because i can kind of be on my own schedule a little bit more that's awesome so from a songwriting perspective since you are so involved with the songwriting aspect what in your opinion makes a good song in my opinion my favorite kind of songs personally i like pop music like i love four on the floor with a simple melody with a great lyric like simple songs are what I love. That's what I personally love. Um, that's not what everybody loves. A lot of people like a lot of time signature changes and key changes and a lot of different stuff. But I, I'm again, I'm old school in the fact that if you can play it on an acoustic guitar and everyone can sing along and it can sound amazing, then that's how you know you've gotten a great song. There are there's plenty of songs out there where the production does make the song so great and does make it what it is and you can't really translate it to acoustic and that's really cool i love that stuff as well but for me personally i'm a big fan of just being able to sing the song on a guitar or on a piano and just have it still sound great that's what i think is great yeah i totally agree i think sometimes 
you know, there's a lot of musicians who really pride themselves in their ability to play their instrument. And, you know, I know you work with a lot of metal music as well. And, and especially in that scene, there's a lot of like guitar virtuosos that want to, you know, show off how awesome they are and how quick they can be. And, you know, even even in like the the pop punk world or whatever, you, you often run into people who like drummers who want to be like overly complicated for the sake of showing off that stuff. Like I find that happens in pop punk all the time. So how do you how do you approach that when you're working with a band that maybe is trying to be a little bit more musicianship forward versus, you know, the song, it's not, it's not serving the song. Again, a, that's a really tough one. That's something that I struggle with every single day, pretty much. But so I basically, I try to embrace that. So, so basically from what I just told you, from what I like from music, I kind of like stuff that's, I don't, okay, let me think of how to word this. So, if you have simple chords and a simple melody, it is really, it can easily come off as being something that's generic and throwaway. So I try to embrace like the extra musicianship or whatever it is that makes that band special and kind of pepper that in to make it something that is simple and good and catchy, but still has like a lot of flair and attitude towards it. So, so I try to kind of just embrace that and, and rein that in, but not go too insane with it where it's just not digestible, basically. That's very cool. Well, yeah, I, I think that as a songwriter, you, you are always kind of approaching that song and how do you make that song show, show off in its best light. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you said earlier that you've done a lot of work with uh, John Feldman and yes, John is one of those people who I really admire his productions and you know, a lot of the records he's made have been some of my favorite records. So I I'm curious just to get a little bit of insight as to like, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from working with him? Man, I've, yeah, I attribute like so much to him. Like I, I learned so much from him. He, one of the biggest things I've learned from him is just how to that you have to deliver, like how to deliver. It's like, it's like, okay, you can have a great band and you can have a great guitar player and you can have like cool stuff and whatever. But at the end of the day, like delivering a record full of great songs that all sound amazing, that are all like good and being able to be like, here is that, that's it. It's done. Like we've put in the work and like, here is that product. And just being able to do that is like, is the most important thing. Just basically being able to get to the finish line of things um, and keep everyone happy and like stoked while doing it. Um, that's that's like that's the most important thing. Like I've learned from him. Like like I never I've never missed a deadline in my entire life. You know what I mean? Um, I yeah. I just show like if I plan something with someone, I'm going to show up on time and we're going to do it and we're going to get it done and we're going to do the best job that we can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that I learned big time from him is just, yeah, how to deliver things. Makes sense. You want to be someone who's reliable and that people want to work with, right? Because if you have that reputation as being the person who always goes over deadlines and like, you know, people are going to not want to continue to work with you because they're going to miss their deadlines. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, also learning how like your attitude is a huge part of, being successful in this business in my opinion like having a good attitude and just like being positive like there's no reason not to and that's only going to make people like want to be around you and like want to be happy and like want to work with you like if you just you know keep the vibe good and keep everyone happy um and yeah like why would you not want to do that but yeah that's just something that john like further prove to me basically of course and i think that that's a major element like i totally agree with you on that that you know if you're not someone who's fun to be around, like no one wants to be around you. So yeah, you yeah know, like, exactly. A lot of, a lot of getting the magic out of performers is getting them in the right headspace. And a lot of that just comes from being a cool person to be around and being friendly. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. People are, people are afraid to put out their emotions in, and record their, their thoughts and feelings if, if they're really kind of uncomfortable in a situation. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's, that's another thing that I've tried to kind of create in my own studio is I want, my studio there's no bad vibes no judgment allowed or uh, like not like because i want people to be able to get to their most vulnerable state and like tell me things that they might be embarrassed to say to their friends and and stuff like that i just i kind of want to cultivate an environment like that where like no one is ever going to feel judged um 
I might challenge you, but like, but no one will ever feel judged or, you know, out of place for saying what they truly think and what they truly believe. Um, and that's like, that's a, that's a huge part of the environment that I try to create. Yeah. I want, I, people need to be honest and open with me. Like, I don't want people to ever work with me and feel like, like, um, some big producer that they need to impress or something and like put on some kind of front and and do with me i just want people to come in and just be real and just make some stuff that they love yeah that's what i want to do awesome one record of yours that you worked on i know you did some some engineering and you did some mixing on it as well was the um the blink california record like i love that record and and uh blink is one of my favorite bands uh and has been for years but i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to work on that record and with a band of that size, like, was there a lot of pressure going into it? Because they had a new singer, you know, there's a lot of expectations of a band of that size. Like, how how did that whole project come about for you? And what was it like working on that? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, Feldman produced that project. And it, ba- it pretty much came to him a day before we started it. He just came in the studio and he's like, we're starting a new Blink-182 album tomorrow. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there was like, there was a ton of... Um, there was a lot of pressure on that because they have a new singer and everything. Um, but the first song that they wrote the first day that we started working with them was bored to death, which wound up being the first single and which is did really successful things and, and which is still one of my favorite songs that I've worked on with them. And so, excuse me. Um, and so basically we started off on that foot and it, that kind of set the tone and just made it, it made, it kind of made, we, we already had that in the bag after one day. And so it kind of just made everything after that really easy because they had something that they felt like really confident in. And, um, yeah, it was honestly working with blink is the, they if not the, they might be one of the easiest, if not the easiest bands that I've ever had to work with. And I think that's a testament to like, to how big they are. I usually find that the bigger the band, the easier that they are to work with and the more professional that they are. Um, and those guys are, are top tier, like as good as it gets, like amazing, super easy to work with, know what they want. Um, and again, it's, it's like, it's not like it's, Oh, it's the easiest thing in the world. Like, like it's making a record is really hard, but yeah, working with those guys, like I would work with those guys any day. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. They're great. When you say that it's, it's easy working with them, like in what respect is it just, you know, more from like a collaboration aspect or, you know? Yeah. Okay. So while Mark is as good of a melody lyric top liner and bass player, he's just, he's so good at, what he does like you can't really touch him like for him being mark havis of blink 182 being able to write blink songs he's a you know he's a professional (laughs) that's what he does and he's he's just so good at it and then travis on the drums obviously is like he's just another level he's he's pioneered an entire style of drumming and has changed the world of drumming forever and so every it's crazy like he'll do like a couple different takes of a song and then he'll play like you know a different beat in the verse different beat in the chorus have like a couple different options and then he'll literally sometimes he would just be like all right zach like yeah what do you what do you think is cool just like use like whatever you think is good (laughs) which is kind of crazy and they're all they're all like amazing um so it's yeah working with there's there's just never really a problem working with them it's like mark's always got super good ideas um and he he can always deliver and then travis same same thing and yeah same thing with skiba he also like props to him he was able to step up to the plate and fill some really big shoes so yeah they're all just super professional at amazing people at what they do that's awesome it's really cool to hear you talk about that because you know, it, it sounds like they're one of those bands that just really improvises in the studio. And, and that's kind of ultimately how it comes together, as opposed to people who maybe have those song ideas, like we talked about earlier, and come in and this is the way it is. I play these parts, that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mark always says to me, like, everything great that Blink has ever done has been a happy accident. So, like, you know, every, like, every cool riff or every 
every like weird lyric like it's there's always like there's like a story that goes behind feeling this where he was like waiting for Tom to come to the studio one day and he was playing a bass riff or a guitar riff or something. And then Travis, he was just kind of like sitting on the couch playing it or something. And then Travis came in and was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like, let me put drums on that. And that's, that's kind of how a lot of their songs wind up getting made. Um, but yeah, again, it's like, you know, blink, they're like the best pop punk band of all time, but there's so many twists and turns to what their band is like, dropping the hip hop beats over punk rock guitars and having nursery rhyme melodies and the personalities and everything that, um, on the surface, I guess it could appear to be a pop punk band, but it's really is much more than that. Um, then yeah, they're, they're great to work with. Yeah. When you describe it that way, it's no wonder that you got to work with them. Cause like going back to how versatile you are and how many different genres you work with, like, it seems like a band that's going to mix all of those different styles together is going to be a perfect fit for you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what I, I, that's, those are the kind of bands that I always seek out. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, but they, they also did, they went to Feldman and I just like (laughs) was his engineer (laughs) at the time, but yeah, but, but yeah, we've worked on a lot. I've, I've remained friends with those guys and we've worked on like many, many, many things, um, since yeah, still talk to them on a daily basis. They're awesome. One element of that record that I really love is that to me, it sounded like, it sounded like some of their previous records that I that I loved. Like it, it kind of had like an enema of the state, take off the pants and jacket kind of feel in terms of some of the tones. Whereas like after those records, they kind of did a little bit more experimenting and kind of had different tones altogether. So it was kind of a cool throwback to me to to get some of those tones. And I, I was curious if there was ever any discussion about that. Like, should we make it sound more like an older record, or or was it just kind of whatever happened in the moment? I think it. Yeah, I think probably a combination of both i think they just wanted to get in and just make the best modern blink record that they could with a new singer and i think that maybe going back um and like referencing like some of their older catalog was like was a good way to kind of bring matt into the group um and have him have him be a part of it to kind of like backtrack like a little bit but have it still be modern and like sound cool and modern yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess, you know, when you're working with the band, like it's easy to get some of those older tones because they, they know how they got them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, we sp- or we spent we spent like a long time getting guitar and bass tones. Um, we want we used Kemper for a lot of it. Um, for Kemp for Mark's bass tone, we actually used like his live bass tone for a lot of it on his Kemper. Um, but we uh yeah, we tweaked that thing for guitars for like probably a couple days to get the guitar tones that we used for that. But yeah, my my um I was really listening to like Take Off Your Pants and Jacket is one of my favorite sonically sounding records of all time. Like Jerry Finn, rest in peace, amazing. Um and I was I was really trying to get tones that were like an updated version of that record. Like that's what I was trying to do. So I, I think you totally nailed it then, man. Cause that's, that's, that's oh, right. That. That's good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting that you talked about using the Kemper on the record. And, and I know that, um, you have a couple sample packs out right now of your Kemper tones and that kind of stuff. So I was curious about your approach for recording guitars. Are you s- still using amps these days? Are you going more Kemper based? Like what's, what's your feeling towards that? So I love amps. I love gear. I love it all. It's just, the speed things are happening these days. Convenience is <laughs> someone. <laughs> there's a guitar player that said to me the other day, he was like, we were discussing this and he's like, convenience is the death of rock and roll. And I was like, yeah, there, okay. There's something to be said for that. But, um, but for me, it's like convenience is, um, is amazing. And so a lot of records that I'll make these days, the band will actually, instead of renting a studio, they'll rent like a really nice Airbnb or like a really cool house. And I'll set up a studio in the family room and we'll record everything there. And so I use my Kemper for a lot of that. And just being able to have that experience and being able to do that and like not make a ton of noise and like have it like be fun is so much more worth it to me than using an amp. Um, but plugins are like really catching up these days and specifically STL tone hub. Um, shout out to the guys over at STL. We, they actually, we just 
released a pack of my own tones on that. But that is, again, with the quarantine and being at home and my Kemper's at the studio and not feeling like bringing that back and forth home with me, I've just wound up using that a lot of the time. And I know a lot of other bands that have as well. And just for, first of all, it does sound amazing. And second of all, like the ease of use is kind of just priceless. It's like if I, if I'm flying somewhere to produce a record and I need to bring my laptop and my Apollo and then pack my clothes and stuff, like I don't feel like bringing, well, I mean, I'm definitely not bringing an amp and cab and like also like a Kemper is like an easy thing to not bring as well if I could just use the software on my computer. And again, I can always like reamp it later if I really want to, but I'm probably, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you find yeah. you're doing a lot of reamping these days? Um, if someone sends me a song to mix and I really don't like the guitar tone and there are DIs available, then I will. But I, I really try not to because even if the tone is like really bad, sometimes it's just like the band's so used to that tone that it can sometimes change things a little bit too much. And that's not really something that I want to tap into. So no, I don't really do too much reamping. That's cool. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes that is the tone, right? Like that's what helps define a band sound, right? Yeah. A hundred percent. A lot of the times I'll go into a mix thinking that I'm going to reamp the guitars and then I'll get like a couple hours in and I'm like, yeah, this sounds, this sounds cool. It sounds good. It's got a vibe. So yeah, I'll just like roll with that. That's awesome. You kind of talked a little bit about uh, mixing. So maybe we should dive a little bit more into your mixing process. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. What's your typical mindset when you go into a mix? Like how and where do you usually start? Okay, so first of all, I'll, I'll, I always, I need a rough mix. Like that's pretty much as a must because I need something to go off of and to improve upon. Um, so I'll listen to that a bunch and try to get into the song and get into the vibe and see what see what's cool about it and see what I think I can improve. And then um, I do a lot of preparation that usually is on a separate day. And that may be anything from putting in drum samples if I need to put them into making, you know, just making sure things are organized and named and color coded and um, and making sure that the vocals are in tune and there's no bad edits and and going through all of the cleanup and stuff like that. And then it, when it comes time to do the actual mix, my I just try to get the song sounding like a, like a song, like as quick as possible. That's my first order of business. Like, like I'm not the kind of person that starts with, I'm going to mix the drums, I'm going to mix the bass, I'm going to mix everything together. I kind of, excuse me, I kind of pull everything up at once and mess with it and and have my master bus instantiated with a bus compressor and a limiter and just try to get it feeling like a rough mix song as quick as possible and a lot of the times i'll ask for people to send me their rough mix sessions if they use pro tools and so a lot of the times i can i like to start where they left off at because then like a lot of their balances and things that they like and that they're used to are kind of there for me to improve upon rather than me having to just rebuild everything from nothing um so getting it to sound like a song is the first step and then from then it'll just be hours and hours of details essentially I, I i spend a lot of time making sure transitions are good like making sure like the chorus really punches in from the verse and making sure that all the different sections of the song flow um between one another and yeah it really comes down to to doing a lot of details like a lot of the times um I, I really do take the rough mix to heart because the band is really used to that. And I want, I want to make sure that what I'm doing is definitely an improvement of that, but not losing the vibe that they captured in the rough mix, because no matter how good or bad certain rough mixes are, they always have a certain vibe to them that people that the band was excited enough about it to send it to, to send it out to get mixed. So a lot of the times I find myself, you know, I'll loop the verse of the rough mix or I'll loop half the verse of the rough mix and listen to it like 10 times. And then I'll bounce back and forth that in mine and just make sure that every little word and every little drum hit and everything in mine is, is doing what it did in the rough, but just in like a better amplified version, if that makes sense. Yeah, that and makes then a lot of sense. 
and and usually in in rough mixes there will be some things that are way out of whack like there will be not nearly enough low end or the vocals will be really quiet which i from doing pop music and kind of like the pop rock crossover stuff that i do i like having vocals be really loud and a, a lot louder than most people um so i find myself like turning up the vocals more than they were in the rough mix a lot of the time as well that's really interesting because uh i agree with you i think that the rough mix is really important because it it almost tells a story of like what they're expecting to get back and you know it it also tells a little bit about some of like depending on who who mixed it you, you get a little bit of like their insecurities as well right like if like you said vocals are really low usually it's like if a singer is mixing they're like i don't want to hear my vocal i'm like self-conscious of it so it, it is really interesting to get that sense of, you know, where do they want things? What do they prioritize? And then, you know, make your own better version of that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. A hundred percent. And like, it's, it's not, it's something that I take very seriously. And like, like, I don't take it lightly. Like if someone is trusting me with their art to finish it off, I, I want to do the best job possible. Like, I don't, I don't take that lightly. Um, if someone is trusting me with that. But yeah, so the goal is to just make sure that it has an amazing vibe like the rough had and that is just better. A lot of the times though, the worse a rough mix is, like if a rough mix is like really bad, a lot of the times that makes my job easier because then I can make it sound better more easily. Whereas if the rough mix is really good, I'll have a rough, I'll have a, a good, a great starting point to jump off of. But sometimes I'm like, okay, what do I have to do to improve this and not make it worse? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's almost um, so like, that, a, it's like a challenge being thrown at you, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. So that's, that's probably some of the hardest mixing that I have to do is when the rough mix is already pretty much there. And then I, I need to find ways to improve upon that. That can be, that can be hard sometimes. Yeah. That's awesome. So how do you know, or at what point do you know that your mix is done? I usually, when I've worked on it, if I have a mix, prepped and ready to go and i i do it all myself by the way i do all my own prep and stuff and it's because there's multiple schools of thought on this but the way i think about it is i personally enjoy doing all the prepping and cleaning everything out myself because it helps me become more familiar with the material and it helps me um just kind of when i mix a song it's it's kind of weird but i just i always think about it like i want to kind of live inside of the song and so the more the more i hear it the more i'm familiar with it and the more like the more i the more i just know it better um and so i find that when i've when i'm actually mixing i it can go pretty quickly i can mix a song usually within three to four hours or so and i when i find that when i start being like who is the vocal like 0.5 db too quiet here like is the kick drum like 0.5 db too bright like that's when it's usually it's time to stop because i can wind up undoing a lot of what i've done as well um and it's also funny a lot of, a lot of the times i will so yeah i'll finish the mix i'll bounce it out listen to it on a bunch of different references and then the last step is i always show it to my girlfriend who she she's a a music fan as well but she's not she she can sing but she's not like a musician or anything and she always gives me like the unbiased like opinion of like either like yeah this sounds amazing or like the vocal i can't understand what he's saying in the verse you know what i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so then i'll usually like that's like the last step she will kind of give me some kind of note about something and then i'll change that and then send it off and it's usually is good to go that's awesome. Someone needs to make like the girlfriend plugin that is like, I, the <laughs> I know, I know. I was just talking about this with one of my friends. It's like, we need to be able to switch between like girlfriend, mom, like, yeah, all, <laughs> like all the different people. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, that would be I, so I sick. love that idea. Just like, just now that you've mentioned like the girlfriend, mom and all that, it's like, man, that that's such a great, great plugin to make. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I got to figure out a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dude, I, I really appreciate your time today, and I, I don't want to take up too much because I know you got a lot on your plate today. So thank you very much for for doing this. Uh, before we wrap up, I was just curious if people want to learn more about you and follow you online. What's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, follow me on Instagram. That's where I post the most. It's just my name at Zach Cervini. Um, so yeah, give me a follow over there. 
Awesome. And uh, lastly, any cool projects that you're currently working on that you can talk about that you're excited about? Yes. Um, when is this going to come out? Uh, probably come out in a few weeks. Okay, cool. Um, so by that time, I'm mixing some new Bring Me the Horizon stuff. So that will be out. Um, that should be out by now. Awesome. And then I have um, Young Blood's new record that I just produced that should be coming soon as well. And what else is coming soon? Yeah, I'm working on a bunch of new records and a bunch of new projects. Oh, yeah, my friend um, Dwayne, he's an up and coming artist. He goes by Dwayne. I'm mixing a bunch of his material right now. And so hopefully he drops some of that stuff soon. But yeah, I'm really excited about that stuff. Amazing. So yeah. amazing. I'm really looking forward to checking all those out. Cool, man. Well, thank you one more time for, for being on here and taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. You got it, man. All right. So that was my interview with Zach Cervini, and that was a lot of fun. It was really cool getting some insight into one of my favorite records from more recent times with that Blink-182 California record. And it was really cool to just hear Zach's approach to things and how adaptable he is. And I loved the whole part about him talking about mixing on headphones and how he approached that transition. And it was really cool to get some insight into his approach with drums and, you know, when to use real drums versus program drums and, you know, how to serve the song. So a really cool conversation. And Zach, if you're listening to this, thank you one more time for being part of this. I had a great time. And for you, the listener, I've got something really cool coming up that I'm really excited to share with you. On September 14th to 20th, I'm going to be hosting a free recording studio workshop all online. And inside of this workshop, we're going to be talking about all things to do with recording from home. We're going to talk about the entire process. We're going to talk about mic positioning, how to edit your instruments. We're going to focus on getting vocals to sound real pro and how to record those, how to edit them, make them sound tight, how to mix your songs and get them sounding amazing. And this is a free video workshop series that I'm hosting. And if you're interested in being a part of it, all you need to do is visit recordingstudioworkshop.com and you can sign up for the waitlist. And then once all of the videos in the series go live, you'll get access to them. I'll just send them to your email and you'll be up to date on every time a new video is released there. So one more time, recordingstudioworkshop.com and it's happening September 14th to September 20th, 2020. So really excited for you to join that. And also, if this is your first time listening to the Master Mix podcast, make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can get notified about all new episodes as they come up. I've got a whole bunch of new interviews lined up, and I'm really excited. We've got some really cool big guests happening, and I'm really excited to share those with you. Also, visit MasterYourMix.com if you're looking to improve the quality of your mixes and you're stuck and you're not sure what to do. If you go to that website, you can also download my free Ultimate Mixing Blueprint, which is a mixing cheat sheet all about how to use EQ and compression in your mixes. So one more time, visit MasterYourMix.com and right away when you get there, you'll see a little pop up or something on the screen that'll tell you where to download that and it's free. Just sign up and it'll help you get amazing results much quicker with your mixes. So that's it for today's episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Love spending time with you guys and really looking forward to chatting with you in the next one. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.